What I'm going to talk a little bit about this morning is the success, hopes, and dreams of people uh, that get involved in the justice system and uh, that in, to ensure that communities offer the same opportunities for success, hopes, and dreams for people that are involved in the justice system. And, you know, I think that the uh, conference organizers really have done a really, really nice job uh, bringing together a, a, a really uh, people with a breadth of information and experience. And, um, and the consumer focus is really, really impressive. So I've had a chance to talk uh, with some of you already, and I'm looking forward to, to more conversation. Um, this isn't my first time in Nebraska. Uh, I'm from New York, and people from New York don't travel through Nebraska generally. So it's, it requires an invitation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we were actually, I was actually here back in 2007. Uh, and, uh, you know, Travis I've known for, and, and Pat uh, for some years now. Uh, and so they, uh, they worked with, uh, then Scott Adams, I think, was the new director, was just new at, at that point, and they asked us to come in to help the state with strategic planning around criminal justice and mental health issues. And we worked with all the regions in the state and the state regional um, uh, behavioral health directors to develop uh, strategic uh, plans for each of the regions of the state. And, uh, uh, it, and I think that some of that work actually is still enduring. Uh, I don't. I um, I have a, a niche habit that very few people in the country do. I, I read state block grants, uh, <laughs> and um, and it, it's funny. It is a little funny because Jim Harvey. At the, how many know Jim Harvey or who Jim Harvey? Okay, good. I mean, he's real. You know, he's probably an unsung hero in your state. And uh, when I came to Nebraska in 2007, I read his state block grant, because what I want to know is, how are those mental health dollars, how do, how do they um, direct and fund programs for people with mental illness in the justice system? Now, in a lot of states, they don't. They're ignored. But in Nebraska, there was a significant pot of money that went directly to diversion programs and some reentry programs and, and it was innovative at the time. And so when I met Jim, when I came to Nebraska, we had dinner before the workshop, I was telling him about how great his block grant program was, his block grant report was. And he looked at me and I swear to God a tear came to his eye and said, I don't think anybody's ever read my block grant before. But I really think he was one of the innovative thinkers about how you use money, how you blend money to improve justice outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you are familiar with the Gaines Center? Okay, so just briefly, the, the Gaines Center um, is oper it's, uh, it's operated by Policy Research Associates. Policy Research Associates is, uh, the president is Hank Stedman, who's really one of the premier researchers in the country around violence and mental health. He's also the person that coined the term jail diversion in 1987 and began researching uh, those, those programs. Uh, he's president of policy research and the Gaines Center is one of several technical assistance centers that's, that's operated by Policy Research Associates. And our, our specific uh, focus with the Gaines Center is to look at criminal justice mental health collaborations. And we get funded by, uh, by SAMHSA to provide technical assistance to community about how you do these criminal justice mental health collaborations. And when communities get uh, grant funding, like the Lincoln Jail Diversion Program did in 2004, we're the technical assistance provider. And that's how I met Pat and Travis. They were, they were uh, key uh, personnel with that program, and uh, they were very innovative at the time, and they've both been Gaines consultants throughout, throughout, the, throughout the years. And I've, got, I've gotten to know them pretty well. The, um, <clears throat> I have on the backs at the conclusion of this uh, talk just a couple handouts of some of the gains, um, uh, criminal justice and mental health issues that I thought would be relevant for, for the talk today. One of them is responding to the needs to justice involved veterans. Um, and uh, it talks about uh, proper methods for screening veterans and engaging them in diversion programs creating a trauma-informed criminal justice system for women. Uh, and we had a number of judges involved in the, in the development of, of this uh, document. 
what every judge needs to know about trauma. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with the judiciary in, in states, and they, they really do appreciate learning and knowing about judges. So I, I think that they're an important target audience when you start talking about these issues because they can direct so much of criminal justice activity and policy in a community. So those are, those are some of um, some of the uh, documents that we have. There's several others on our website. Please visit it. I travel a lot. You know, we have, a, we have, a nat we have national exposure, and, and, so, um, and I develop close friendships like I have with Pat and Travis, and, and these friendships become important. And between the traveling and the issues that you deal with and sleeping in different uh, venues all the time, things get mixed up in your dreams. <laughs> And last, last night I had a dream, and I dreamt that I was with Travis and Pat, and we were in Afghanistan. We do a lot of work with veterans. And we were driving along, and Pat sees something shiny on the roadside, and she says, stop the truck, stop the truck. And so I stop the truck, and she goes out and grabs this thing and rubs it, and the genie pops out. And uh, so the genie says, so we're, we're all excited, you know, because we're not particularly happy being in Afghanistan. I don't even know why we were there. We were just, you know, you know the dreams. So, I, so oh, great, we, we each get three wishes. No, no, the economy's very bad, very bad. You each get one wish. So Travis says, well, I'll go first, I'll go first, you know. Um, tomorrow, my, my daughter Alexis is given a presentation, and... It's, it's all-star season, and my sons are on the all-star teams, and I want to get back and help coach those teams. I want to go home and coach those teams. So the genie nods his head, and Travis is gone. Then Pat says, uh, well, I'll go next. And she says, you know, a good, good, very dear friend of mine is getting an award for her work in recovery. And, and I, you know, I promised that, if anything, I would be there. I would be there for her, and I would really like to be there for her, and it's tomorrow, and, and I, I want to I go back and, and be at that award ceremony. Jeannie nods his head, and she's gone. And he turns to me, and he says, well, what's your wish? And I looked to the left, I looked to the right, and I said, I'm, I'm feeling kind of lonely. I kind of wish they were back here with me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You can pick your friends, but <clears throat> so developing trauma-informed approaches to justice-involved persons with mental illness. So, as Dr. Howard, Laura Howard, said yesterday, trauma and justice is one of SAMHSA's st strategic initiatives. Uh, so. It, and there's certain goals under those initiatives. The first is develop a comprehensive public health approach to trauma. I would like to remind everybody that when you're talking about public health approaches to anything, jails are a public health institution in your community. So often communities are doing really, really fine work around any number of public health issues, including behavioral health issues, and the jails get excluded, so what happens? People come into jail, there's no continuity of care, they can't get the medications they need. The, the jail is flying blind, so to speak, because they can't get the, the records from the community providers into the jail so that they can follow the treatment plans that have been established. And then coming out of jail, the community doesn't get the, the, get the, um, get the, records, get the records from the jail so that they know what happened to jail. And, there's, and jails become an island within a community. Jails are public health institutions, and they need to be computed, uh, uh, included in public health planning overall, including around issues with trauma. Uh, screening for trauma and early intervention treat, treatment is common practice. And again, this should happen in the justice system, in your jails with probation. And we'll see some of the reasons why as we get uh, along in this presentation. Reduce the impact of trauma and violence on children, youth, and families. You'll hear, <clears throat> you'll hear people talk about intergenerational violent, 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 uh, uh, transmission of violence. And the earlier we intervene, the better outcomes we're going to have for generations to come. Address the needs of people with mental disorders, substance use disorders, co-occurring disorders, or a history of trauma in the criminal justice system. So these are the goals, and these are good guidelines for communities to follow. So let's start with, uh, <clears throat> with, with what we're talking about with trauma. Now, um, you know, I reviewed the, uh, 
uh, the, pro the conference program, and you are going to hear a lot of really good presentations uh, about trauma. And uh, there certainly are people, uh, Ann Jennings is, is, is going to be one of your speakers later on. And when I was the unit chief at Bedford Hills in, um, back in the, in the 80s, uh, which is the, a woman's prison, she was, the, she was the person I would look to to figure out what we were doing because the, the issue about trauma and treatment of trauma, especially in the justice system, really wasn't commonplace at that, at that point. She was, she was a pioneer in this field and she'll be able to speak to you much more articulately than I will about issues with trauma, but we should start with a common definition. So what is trauma? It's an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically, emotionally harmful, or threatening, and the effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, spiritual well-being are lasting. So the events, it can be one event, or as you know, Destiny so articulately um, pointed out, it can be a series of events. It can be really a lifelong exposure to danger and risk and abuse. And that, that, that experience is uh, certainly uh, physically and threatening, compromising. Not everybody who experiences trauma, however, um, ends, ends up with a diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, Senator Johans mentioned yesterday that about 20% of the combat soldiers are coming back with PTSD. So there's a lot of factors that affect uh, who gets PTSD and who doesn't. Some of them are genetic, some, some of it are the, is, the, uh, is the social and family support that somebody might have, and, um, and some of it is how quickly people, the, the issues of PTSD get addressed. That's key. So the earlier we intervene, the better outcomes we're going to have. Now, <clears throat> I was going to show you some video about the link between tr what does trauma have to do with crime. Is Destiny here, by the way? She, okay, so I just thought she really did a very eloquent job at demonstrating yesterday the link between trauma and crime. As uh, you know, she had uh, neglectful of parenting, abusive parenting over long term. She, she got exposed to drugs by her father. As a result of that, she ended up dealing drugs. <laughs> Uh, living in high-risk environments uh, with antisocial people. I mean, it's, it's a direct causal link in, in that situation. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to show you one of the videos because I think Destiny uh, described that pretty clearly. I'm going to show you a, another one of them, though, because I, I think, is, especially with justice populations, um, the, the difficulty of being able to identify and treat trauma in correctional settings. So Vern, uh, that I'm gonna, Vern is somebody who's been to prison. Um, and uh, coming out of prison, uh, you know, he had, a, he had a long history of violence. And coming out of prison, he was lucky enough to get into a program called Howie the Harp, which was a forensic peer specialist program in New York City. Uh, and he became a, a peer specialist working, working in that community. So uh, he's talking about his experience of trauma. And then I'll have a few comments after he's, he's done. When I started going to uh, public school, I, I remember a lot of fights I got into because the kids would say, you don't have no parents. And that hurt. When, when I say it hurt, I didn't know how to express hurt other than strike back at you. That's what the, the, the tough guy is about. Not getting to know me. Keeping you at a distance. Because I don't want you to hurt me. It's a couple interesting things, I think. One is, I thought that was normal. So when people come into the correction system, you know, he talked about that tough shell, that hard shell. You don't let people close. You, you don't make yourself vulnerable. And so when you're working in a prison environment, people aren't going to come up to you and say, and I need help with trauma. They don't, it's not recognized as trauma. It's recognized, it's just the way things are. 
And again, working in the correction system, um, I, I learned to fight back. It's better to, f to, to strike out first than to be a victim, which is part of the culture of any prison setting. So those behaviors certainly get uh, quickly labeled as antisocial behaviors. People who can't, you know, and once you have that label on you, well then you, you know, you're really, it's very difficult to help you. But if you dig underneath those behaviors to figure out what it is that's driving those behaviors, what's the pilot light that keeps those behaviors going, oftentimes it's trauma. And it's important for, for people working in the, in the correction system, not just the clinicians, but officers and, the, and, and, and other personnel working to understand what those manifestations are so that people can be screened, identified, and start to get the help they need so that they'll have, uh, they can begin their road to recovery. Are we trauma-informed as a system? Multiple studies show that between 2% and 5% of persons with PTSD, this is studies of, of treatment, of different treatment programs, <laughs> mental health treatment programs, had a PTSD diagnosis in their record. Another study showed that clinicians were aware of P, uh, PTSD but lacked skills to treat it. Uh, SAMHSA just finished a survey of substance abuse treatment services and <clears throat> what they found was that through the survey of, uh, of their, of their uh, SAMHSA funded substance abuse programs is that 70 percent reported that there's trauma related counseling always or sometimes. 28 percent said always. So uh, there, there's some, ex there's, there's some uh, a transmission of the importance of trauma through, through the substance abuse system. Eight, uh, Nebraska actually did a little better than the national averages with 89 percent reporting always or sometimes having some trauma related counseling. But when you looked at some of the trauma specific services, se seeking safety and some of the, uh, and, and actually uh, having trauma experts on staff, the rate goes much further down. 22 percent was the overall rate. Uh, with uh, facilities having mental, that focused on mental health and substance abuse treatment having a slightly higher rate of, of uh, trauma-specific services. So there's, there's still a lot to be done in terms of uh, expanding trauma services throughout our service system. And what, what are tr the characteristics of a trauma-informed system? So, and this, uh, this, um, these guidelines were developed by Maxine Harris and Roger Fallett from Community Connections in, in Washington, D.C. They really are national uh, experts around trauma-informed uh, services. So it, to integrate trauma awareness into service delivery, so that means training. People have to be trained about that, that these are populations with high degrees of trauma. There should be screening across systems for trauma, so again, so that there's early intervention and better, and better outcomes, and training is key. Hire workers with trauma expertise. You know, this isn't necessarily a generic kind of skill that you have. There are some very specific skills in terms of understanding trauma, and, and there's more specificity around, around tra trauma treatments. There's more modulized programs. Cognitive processing therapy is another, and, and other CB, uh, cognitive behavioral kinds of programs have been very effective. Uh, EMDR is another uh, uh, effective intervention for trauma. So, it's important to have workers with trauma expertise to review policies and pr procedures to identify procedures that may re-traumatize individuals. So again, one of the, one of the easy things to do uh, that a lot of communities are doing now, and I know Nebraska is doing it now, is hiring peers uh, to be, really be at the front door of your system, to welcome people into the system and, and promote engagement. Uh, treatment, uh, consumer choice is important and delivering services with consumer participation is important. So how does this relate to, to the justice system? <clears throat> and why do police have to know about trauma? Uh, Robert is a, is, a, is a veteran who was, a, who was exposed to combat trauma. And, he's, and he's, he's, uh, he's been back and he's married, and, but he's got significant disability as a result of that. And he describes an interaction with, with a police officer. One day, I was driving home from work, and I went home, got my things, me and my wife started arguing a little bit now. I left, came back out, got in the car, and I calmed down, 
And the police pulled me over. I'm like, what did I do now, officer? He says, sir, I'm asking you to drive the license and registration in the insurance car. So I produced it. And that voice hit me. It said, kill, 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 kill. I was like, no, this man didn't do nothing to me. But the man saw, the officer saw that. There wasn't, there was something wrong with me. I was, I was hostile. I was very, very nasty attitude. He kept his composure. If he didn't keep his composure, I think I would have exploded much more than I did. But he kept his composure. And he kept very calm. His partner, he told his partner, I got this. Because his partner was ready to jump, jump in the car and drag me out. And, you know, I'm like, okay. And he said, sir, please step out of the car. He said, I, I had a suspended license. I said, a suspended license? Why? He didn't know, and I, I didn't ask, and he just, we just commenced getting the cuffs and handcuffing me and whatnot. So I said, okay, cool in the gang. When his, when his partner started patting me down, I just didn't like that. I just didn't like me patting down. Because it's the way, it's not so much what he was doing, it's the way he was doing. Okay, you can pat somebody down without being hostile. This officer did not want to take me into the precinct. He said, I'll take you to the King, we go to King's County. I said, worst of all, I, I deserve a phone call. I was telling him all my rights and whatnot. <laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah, okay. You get everything you deserve as soon as you see the doc. I mean, this officer, he was a professional in my mind. Because he kept his calm. He didn't have to. I mean, I would call him everything under the sun. He would just say, no, Mr. Wright, you know that's not necessary. <laughs> so he was very composed. And like, the doctor came out and spoke to me and asked me what was the matter. I was trying to explain to the doctor. I haven't had my medication. I was tired. I did I had a fight with my wife. I was going home. This cop one stop. No, he's a, he was not a cop. He was an officer. I got to give him that. And I was explaining all this to the doctor at Kings County. And he was saying, you know, your explosive behavior, your aggressiveness is all focused on your post, on your on your diagnosis. I said, here, yeah, okay, really. Just tell him, he said, we're gonna keep you for a few weeks, for a few days. So I said, cool in the gang. I get away from my wife. I have a big square deal. Don't have to worry about work. And you don't have to do nothing. There are thousands of interactions between police and people with mental illness a day. They don't always end up like that. With lack of training, Robert could have very easily, given his attitude, been charged with resisting arrest and taken to jail. It's important for police to understand about trauma and mental illness. <coughs> Two, uh, well, actually, four years ago now, I, um, I <coughs> was on a panel uh, at the Atlanta Crisis Intervention Team Conference, and we were talking about, it was, Little had been done really about uh, justice and veterans, police and veterans, so that we had a panel called Improving Law Enforcement Response to Veterans. We had, there was a panel, a psychiatrist friend of mine and, and uh, Tom Kirchberg from the VA in, uh, in Memphis. <clears throat> and we presented about PTSD and the manifestations of PTSD and some, and some of the things a police officer might see. Two weeks after that, after that panel, this is the letter uh, an email that we that we received from one of the participants in in the, in the workshop. I do not even know how to begin to thank you for your class improving police encounters with returning veterans. 
I had been home just a week and was already confronted with the Marine OIF and PT PTSD. Your video helped me interpret reckless driving and anger as possible PTSD symptoms. It saved us from having to go hands-on because I was able to reach out with verbal skills I learned in the class and de-escalate the situation. In fact, because of that same video and that scenario where the vet had the handgun, I was able to ask the right question, do you have any weapons? He looked me straight in the eye and began to weep and asked me to take the weapons for safekeeping until he was ready to have it back. What a heart-wrenching sight to have this honorable Marine hand over his weapon to me. I gave him and his wife the veteran suicide phone number that I put in my contacts. On Monday, I will contact the VA in my area uh, and have them follow up, and she did. And again, another uh, <clears throat> situation was averted because officers had their proper training. Police are starting to recognize this is becoming fairly commonplace, police interactions with veterans, and you're starting to see in police bulletins and uh, police uh, news, uh, <coughs> news magazines uh, de uh, descriptions about de-escalation of veterans when you're, when you're confronted with them in, in the course of your duty. So these are some of the engagement questions that uh, there's police are suggesting uh, that one asks uh, if, you find a, uh, if you encounter a veteran, do you currently serve in the military? Ask about those issues. If you find out that the person's a, a veteran, what's your med military specialty? Get them talking about those issues. What, you know, get, start to make the link between the behavior and PTSD so that provides you a foothold into the talking about what's going on and de-escalating the situation. Um, and then uh, we also know from a lot of the veterans programs that we've worked with that connection with other veterans is really critical. So making those connections. So these, are, these are th aren't things that you know, mental health people are saying. These are people now, uh, these are suggestions that the, mil that the police community are saying uh, need to be done for safe interactions between veterans and police officers. Another, th another uh, <clears throat> important thing to be aware in terms of having a trauma-informed system is the work we do is hard. We, are, we have to be in mind that we are exposed to trauma in the course of our works. There's a recent study that emergency workers are twice as likely to suffer from PTSD. The work that we do is exposure to trauma, other, the, the trauma of other people. And sometimes we carry those issues um, home with us to our families, or they can affect our own adjustment. You can see substance abuse and these kinds of early problem behaviors. And, uh, it's important within management and in terms of human resources to be aware that, that uh, these are risks for our workforce and to be in a situation to address them. We know, for example, that about 50% of police who are involved in a, in a shooting incident, a fatal shooting, develop PTSD. So again, being proactive about, about our systems and our personnel is, is important. The International Association of Police Chiefs have developed three uh, guidebooks around these issues uh, for veterans. One of them is uh, for uh, law enforcement officers who are veterans. It's a transition guide, how to, work, how to come back into a police force and work by civilian rules of engagement as opposed to military rules of engagement. Double duty, a guidebook for families of deployed law enforcement officers. We know that law enforcement's a brotherhood and they take care of their own. So this is some guidelines about if a, if a fellow officer is deployed, what are the supports for the family. And then for leadership, you know, leadership in law enforcement is important, and they have a, a, a law enforcement leader's guide for combat veterans that are on the police force. So again, there's more, uh, there are more resources available to ensure that we have trauma-informed law enforcement. Why does a correction officer have to know about trauma? <clears throat> So this uh, note is from a superintendent in Ohio who had just had his, uh, his corrections officers trained on trauma-informed care. And it's a vignette about a female officer who, uh, I mean, sorry, a female offender who was, I mean, you would hope it wasn't the officer awakened by the inmate. It was the, the offender was awakened by the officer. And when the offender woke, she was startled, she was upset, she got combative with the officer, rose up out of her bunk and started slapping and hitting. Now, normally in a correctional environment, the officer pulls the pin, steps back, takes out a baton. There's, but what, the officer recognized this as a possible symptom of trauma. Instead of engaging, the officer stepped back and started talking 
about what's happening. What's happening here right now, reorienting reorienting the person to where she was. And sure enough, what had happened was this woman had been sexually abused by her brother over uh, over a number of years and, and would be awakened out of her sleep. And this was her startle response when she was awakened like that. The officer, uh, having identified that as, as a possible trigger, worked out a situation with the inmate so that the next time that happened, uh, there, there, could, there could be an accommodation so that that wouldn't be triggered again. But again, preventing a disciplinary hearing and, and perhaps injury to the officer and the inmate because the officer had the trauma training. In Rhode Island, where they uh, trained uh, their, their jail staff around uh, uh, trauma, uh, manifestations and responses to trauma manifestations. If you just, I don't know how many of you can see the bottom figures right here, but in 2007, there were nine, 97 unusual incidents. So incidents where there was uh, a fight or assault or, or, or violence between staff and an inmate. 2007, there were 97. 2008, after the training, there was 51. In 2009, there was 18. Once the trauma-informed training starts to take hold in an institution, it dramatically changes the culture of that institution. So it's important that corrections understand about trauma-informed training. Why does probation have to know about trauma? <clears throat> this is an interesting, very interesting situation. So John Brownfield served in Iraq. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he, was, he, he did search and rescue. And so what he was exposed to on a daily basis were, were bodies that had been shot, burned. Uh, he responded to helicopter crashes. Sometimes the victims were children. And this was his daily job. Coming back uh, to the United States, he showed the typical behaviors that we often see with, with veterans uh, with PTSD who have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, road rage, reckless driving, fighting, inability to control anger and drinking. <clears throat> so um, after a number of false starts with careers, he's able to get a job in the federal prison system as a, as a correction officer because his father worked in the prison system and he was able to get his son in, into the prison system. Within a month of his employment, he starts, um, he starts smuggling in contraband cigarettes. Well, that's a felony. You know, it's a felony in the prison system. And there's in the sentencing guidelines, federal sentencing guidelines are you do a year and a day. You have to go to prison and you at least that's the minimum. But probation did what probation does so well. They go and they get the facts and they did their pre-sentence investigation. Their pre-sentence investigation showed that he was an exemplary high school student, that he never had any trouble, that he had rich friendships, and that it wasn't until he came back, they interviewed, probation interviewed his family, it wasn't until he came back that he started showing these anger and the fighting and the drinking and all these other issues. So the judge gets the probation report. <laughs> it, you know, in service of full disclosure, it wasn't Judge Judy, it was Judge Kane from... But the judge got the probation report and said, well, wait a minute. The federal guidelines never anticipated this scenario. And he wrote a 30-page opinion about why he was going to divert from the sentencing guidelines so that this veteran could get the help that he needed. And he was, in fact, placed on probation and went uh, and received the VA services and got the help that he needed. Probation needs to understand about... Now, one of the... Um, so the prevalence of, of trauma in the justice system. The uh, GAIN Center has provided technical assistance and evaluation to over 50 programs, uh, jail diversion programs, since 2002. And we have some evaluation data from those programs. And one of the, one of the pieces of the data is, is about trauma prevalence. So what we found in our study was that for women, 96% of the women with mental illness, because mental illness to get into the jail diversion program, 96% reported lifetime trauma. 74%, this surprised us a little bit, reported current trauma, meaning that within the year prior to the arrest, they had experienced a traumatic episode. So the people that we work with, that you work with when you're, your jail diversion programs, it's not like when you're approaching trauma where we have to help people resolve their past trauma. They're currently in unsafe relationships. 
They're currently in unsafe environments and there's a lot of risk-taking behavior. And very often, you're not talking about therapy, you're talking about just putting a safety net around people and identifying what some of their safety risks are. Now, what do you think the prevalence rates are for men? Almost no different. Almost no different. And it, in fact, the, you know, the current trauma is higher. I think men for, uh, tend to be exposed from other trauma justice studies to more, um, more street violence than, than women, except for one exception, and I'll show you. So the difference between genders is minimal, and trauma is not past, but it's ongoing. This was another study that, uh, po that the policy research was involved in, and it was a mental health court study of, of four mental health courts. And again, there was a trauma uh, survey done there. And, this, this, and I've seen this also with other uh, justice populations, but if you look at the top, sexual abuse or rape prior to age 20, 70% of the women, you don't find those rates in war zones. So again, when we talk about uh, the safety needs of the population that we work with, it's why housing is very often so important to ensure that people have stable and safe places to live. And again, high rates of both current, this is just the childhood sexual abuse, that, uh, physical rather abuse that women and, and men experience. It's why the rates are a little lower. Are there, how many veterans in the audience? Wow. How many uh, military family in the audience? Could you stand up, please? Thank you for your service. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, as the situation with uh, that po police officer and, and that veteran, um, the issue of justice involved veterans continues to be uh, an issue that I don't think has received enough penetration throughout the justice system. I'm going to show you a video of, uh, well, the, the, the video will be self-explanatory, a, a veteran uh, who uh, give, was giving one of the, t uh, t the TED Talks. Sir, what makes the Green Rise wrong? And I was going to be the eyes and ears of the convoy. 
The drive from Tikrit to Fallujah was only supposed to take about 10 hours, even with the slow military vehicles. But the enemy had other plans. On the way down, they started blowing up bridges and setting up ambushes along the way. We would redirect our path each time we would come into a new contact. And after 36 hours of non stop combat, no sleep, and high stress, your mind starts to play tricks on you. I start seeing things that aren't there, you start hearing things that aren't there, you start to lose control of your rage. At some point, the second night of no sleep, I must have fell asleep, dozed off the cool air, rocking me to sleep, because I woke to total chaos, gunfire. I remember hearing that AK-47 rounds hit the side of the home V just inches from my head. Tink, 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 tink. I woke up, fear washed over me. I remember the pink glow of RPGs shooting through the air in every direction. Total chaos, explosions all around me. I lit up the 50 cap. Thump, 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 thump. Moving from one target to the next. In the middle of all this chaos, I could hear somebody laughing. I thought to myself, who could be laughing at a time like this? And then I realized it was me laughing. I felt like I was finally losing control of that rage they taught me to harness. Come time to leave Iraq, and they asked for volunteers to stay. They needed somebody to find and neutralize the IEDs that were killing so many people. It wasn't a decision that I took lightly. But if I didn't volunteer, they were going to pick people. And I wasn't married, I didn't have kids, and I didn't want them to pick somebody with a family. So I volunteered for a second tour. That second tour, we spent three or four vehicles to go out every day. We'd drive about 10 miles an hour down the road, barely moving. We'd look at the side of the road, try to find the IEDs, improvise the explosive device, and we'd wait for the road to blow up on us. <coughs> While in Iraq, I lost seven of my best friends. My transition home was difficult to say the least. I was paranoid. I carried a pistol on me at all times. I assessed the threat level of every person or place I came in contact with. Driving through my family's neighborhood, I drove in the middle of the street and feared that the side of the road was going to blow up and kill me. On the outside, I looked like every other 21-year-old college student. I bought the newest clothes, I played beer pong, chased girls, rooted for the blood guys. But inside, there was something wrong. After a few months, my family and friends convinced me that there was something wrong and I needed some help. I went to the VA, walking mental health clinic, and I told them, you guys gotta help me. I'm gonna hurt someone. I don't want to. I carry a pistol to protect myself, but I'm scared. They gave me a prescription for a sleep aid and sent me on my way until when to come back in six months. I didn't make it six months. A few months later, <clears throat> I was out with some friends. We were drinking. We were having a good time. I'd been drinking every day to deal with my issues. It's hard to think of yourself as an alcoholic when you're playing beer pong, but we're drinking every day here in alcohol. We're out, we're having some drinks, and then an argument erupted over a girl. So I pulled out a knife and I snapped. I pulled out my pistol. The prosecutor said, I moved through the room in a tactical manner, cleared the room, and laid everybody on the ground. I took the knife from him, 
And I'll be empty. And I'll be. And I'll be. A few days later, I got arrested for attempted murder and several other charges. Someone did it, someone didn't do it. When I went in for sentencing, my judge told me, Mr. Chambers, your service is a double edged sword. Your time in Iraq makes you a threat to society, and I have a civil obligation to lock you up. I received 10 years, and here I am today. Some of you that are familiar with the TEDx format are probably waiting on my call to action, but you just did it. Find a veteran and listen to a story. A lot of us just need somebody to talk to. <clears throat> Veterans in the justice system, the earlier that we get help, that they get help, the better the outcomes are going to be. There were several warning signs for him, and he, we, he wasn't able, the system wasn't able to offer him the help he needed it when he needed it most. So, <clears throat> VA in, the VA in Nebraska, I don't know a lot about the VA in Nebraska, this is from the VA website. Uh, your, the hospital apparently is in Omaha, your main, your main hospital, and then there's a, a network of <clears throat> community-based outpatient clinics. Um, and then also, and then a couple vet centers in your population areas. I was just reading and uh, I got a report just yesterday through a listserv that, um, so the, Nebraska has two major population centers. Veterans in rural areas have worse outcomes. They're, they tend not to be connected to uh, VA services. They tend not to be receiving benefits that, that they should be receiving. And they tend not to be uh, connected to, the, to, to both health and mental health services that they need. So that, I'm guessing, is an issue, uh, is an issue in Nebraska. My guess is, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later, but it's important you, uh, to understand that the VA cannot handle all that veterans' issues on their own. There needs to be partnerships with community providers, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. How many know what a Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinator is? Okay, just a handful. How many know Tammy? Oh. Uh, do you know who the, who the person is now? Sandra Miller. Sandra Miller? Okay. <clears throat> so the, the VA's certainly received a lot of criticism. It's certainly justifiable. But one thing that the, that the VA has done right is really um, to address the issue of justice-involved veterans early on. They've had this VJO program, and, and, and we were actually involved in helping uh, set, set it up, train the Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinators on the justice system and how you engage the justice system. Across the country, the work of the Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinators has just been phenomenal. Uh, their, their mission is, 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 uh, is ambitious. Uh, they're, they're, they're told to get out, to train police, work with veterans courts, uh, help develop diversion programs. Um, and, it's, and it's not just in a locality. Many of the, veter the, the Veterans Justice Outreach Coordinators are connected to a hospital, and that hospital services multiple counties. So they, they're, they're, their span and their geographic reach is very far, so they, they also can't do everything. But they're incredible resources to be aware of. And, uh, and to, again, integrate into planning and use their resources for training uh, different, different criminal justice folks. Our latest, uh, our latest um, uh, grantee cohort that the Gaines Center was providing technical assistance to is something called the Jail Div Diversion Trauma Recovery Priority to Veterans Program. So what that was is over a three-year period, 13 states got um, Got, got funding to do a couple things. One is develop a statewide infrastructure that would support local diversion of veterans. So collaborations with the VA, with labor, with the mental health and substance abuse communities. So they set up that statewide infrastructure and planning com uh, committee. And then to develop at least one pilot program 
uh, in a community and then expand out from there and then start to cascade the diversion programs throughout the state. So there's 13 states that got funding to do that. And we've So we've learned some things. There's an evaluation component to this program. And so uh, look, at, there's an N of about 1,200 uh, people that have gone through those, those jail diversion programs now in 13 states. And this is what we've learned. That 50% are OEF, OIF veterans. Uh, that um, the, there's still 25% uh, are Persian Gulf veterans who you never really hear talked about very much in the news, but 20% of the people going through the program are Persian Gulf veterans, which again I think speaks to the chronicity of some of the PTSD that, that, uh, that veterans face. Uh, <clears throat> there's a group of uh, post-Vietnam veterans who, who were not necessarily combat veterans. And then lastly, uh, there still are some Vietnam, you know, 10 to 15% Vietnam veterans still out there getting involved in the justice system. <clears throat> so that's the military era. This is the military status of the clients, uh, of, of, the, of the people going through the program. Uh, if I, if just going here, in, under the discharge status, honorable general. So sometimes you hear uh, issues about veterans involved in the justice system. Well, these were the guys that got dishonorable discharges. No, they aren't. 92% had honorable or general discharges. Now, moving up into the service column, served in a combat theater zone. 55% of the people in the jail diversion programs have served in the combat theater zone. But then we looked at some of the other trauma data. 95%, and this is very, this is very similar to the, uh, prof, the trauma prevalence that we found in our jail diversion programs that didn't serve as veterans. Very similar. There's a real nexus between trauma and incarceration, regardless of whether it's a veteran population or not a veteran population. So 95% reported lifetime trauma. 73% reported trauma under 18. So people are going into the service with, with histories of trauma, and that military service can, uh, can, be, can enable other trauma kinds of reactions. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a group that, that if you're arrested, you've already got a significant history of trauma. And similar to the jail diversion group, 60% reported trauma in the past 12 months. So when you're working with veterans, it's not just the combat veteran piece. It's also that, the, that if, if they're arrested, if a veteran is, is arrested, he's had other lifetime trauma that has to be uh, addressed. <clears throat> the other uh, surprising information that we uh, came across is that 87% had one or more prior arrests in lifetime, 69% have been on probation previously, 52% spent time in prison for a conviction that tells me that there were a lot of opportunities prior to this jail diversion program to help veterans and intervene sooner. These, these folks have been in the justice system before and they've, they've been missed or maybe they weren't ready at that time. But again, I think we have to work harder to catch people earlier. The, um, so I mentioned that the states had to develop a statewide infrastructure uh, to, to roll out these programs. These were the key components, and I really think they're, 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 uh, they're good guidelines for any state that wants to take a comprehensive look at trauma and uh, at, at justice involved veterans. Screening across your systems of, about, uh, military, about military experience. That includes the mental health system and the justice systems. Uh, and across the justice system, if you, when we first went and did our initial site visits with uh, the states around their veteran diversion programs, everybody was excited about diverting veterans, and then they said, well, where are they? They couldn't find veterans because nobody was screening for them. So they had to set up screening mechanisms. Uh, <clears throat> Trauma-informed care is a, much, uh, is, is a must, and I won't belabor that. I think that point's pretty clear. Building community competency uh, service community service competency, treating veterans in co coordination between the VA and VA providers to maximize choice. Not all veterans will go to the VA hospital for a lot of reasons. Uh, veterans who live in rural uh, areas can't get to the VA hospital. 
Uh, some have a prejudice against receiving VA services, and it's, abs and, and it's absolutely key that community providers begin to learn about military culture and some of the specific trauma issues with veterans and, be a, and have a capacity to treat it. There really needs to be partnerships there. Uh, peer pre veteran peer presence and, and planning committees, uh, and again, as establishment uh, in, in local advisory boards, bringing veterans onto those advisory boards, including the VA, so that there's a comprehensive approach. A lot of states are beginning to address uh, uh, veterans' diversion through legislation. And it's a mixed bag, to be honest with you. I've reviewed, I think, most states, uh, the legislation of most states, and what I've observed is this, that some legislation restricts diversion to only combat-related trauma. Now, we've seen from the data that only half of the people going through our diversion programs were in combat. So that would have excluded about 600 people from those diversion programs because their trauma wasn't trauma-related. Some exclude veterans by virtue of uh, discharge status. So if you have a general, discharge, uh, a, a general discharge or below, or, or discharge under less than honorable uh, conditions or below, you're not eligible for, the, for uh, a diversion program. And we know that a lot of veterans are discharged uh, under dishonorable discharges because of the effects of their PTSD, and so then they're involved in, in appealing that. But they would not be allowed to go into a diversion program. Uh, some legislation uh, identifies specific charge levels, whether or not there's physical injury to victim. Some programs restrict people who have a DWI history or a prior felony, a prior felony or violent crime or domestic violence history. Some require a conviction, require a conviction. That's devastating for, for people in, in careers and their ability to move on and recover. Some legislatures, some, some laws uh, define uh, the duration uh, somebody has to stay in a program. That's a clinical decision. It's not a legislative decision, in my opinion. Um, and, if there, and if you've been in a program and failed, then you can't go back into another program. And we know that sometimes it takes more than one chance. So if it's an appropriation bill for, the, for legislation, yeah, let's do the appropriation bill's good. If it's enabling le legislation, that's good too. Some legislatures say we authorize courts to develop and communities to develop programs and, develop, and then provide a skeleton of what those programs should include, but don't get into the progr programmatic functions with it, and these issues get addressed at the local level. Um, if uh, if you're, you're doing a veterans program, eventually you're going to have to address the issues of domestic violence, weapons possessions, and DWIs, or you're not going to be able to service your veterans. And I'm not saying to do it recklessly. Victims' rights are important. But once, once and very often programs will start excluding those charges, and that's fine. That's fine. You have to start somewhere. You have to build trust and learn and, and among the different players, because there's different cultures, you have to build that trust. But once people start to hear the individual circumstances of the people coming for them, you'll see gradual expansion of, of looking at, at different types of crimes and circumstances. So the essential principles of program development, trauma focus, flexibility with charges, minimize collateral sanctions, broad clinical criteria, <clears throat> not just PTSD or combat-related trauma, screening across systems, peer mentor involvement, joint partnerships, and choice for the veterans. I'm going to finish. Can I have three minutes? Can I have three minutes? <clears throat> so I want to finish. Um, I, I like this story because it's a story within a story. Sergeant Matthew Pennington, who you see here, um, was somebody who served in Iraq, and while in Iraq he was, in, he, was, he was in a Humvee and there was an IED and he lost his leg. And he came back, uh, was at Walter Reed for a while for rehabilitation, and, and, and did, you know, got stabilized, went home to Maine, where he um, uh, was isolated from his veteran peers and not, not having all the services he, he needed at the time. Uh, started to drink and, and have a, a number of problems. He, uh, through a veteran support program, got to go to San Antonio for more hol holistic treatment and some treatment for his TBI. One tragedy does not protect you from other tragedies. His brother committed suicide back in Maine, and he and his wife had to go back to uh, Maine to help take care of his nephew. Once back in Maine, he was isolated again, started drinking and having more problems. When he saw an online advertisement from an NYU student who also lived in Maine, who was looking, who had a project, and he wanted to do a project on a wounded Iraqi war veteran. So he applied. 
uh, for, to, to, for this acting job. And what always uh, is interesting when I hear people talk about their stories, there's always a point in time where they, where they make a decision. Uh, you know, certainly the supports and the medication, the treatment, all those things, are, but there's a point in time where somebody makes a decision, I have to stop this. And there's a point in time where they, f they, they find their own path, their own interest, that is, ex that, that is going to help them and bridge them into a, a, a world of recovery. And this film did it for, Mr. P for Sergeant Pennington, and I just want to finish it because it's a message of resilience and hope. Out of the hands. That's a heal. When I got home, I totaled the town launch. Crashed it right into the side of these piers. 200 grand in damage. Yeah, Humvee took a hit my first time outside the wire. Shrapnel went right through my leg. It's a clean slice. Damn. A year ago today, April 29th. What? Today's your alive day? Yeah. Yeah, hell of a day. Oh, it's time to celebrate. Very much to celebrate. Come on now. We're going out, just like we used to. You and me, we'll tie one on. Donald, listen to me. You take all the time you need out here. But trust me on this, son. You stay out here too long, you'll never get back. Thank you. Can everybody please give Dan a round of applause?